Well, a New Year's resolution to myself was to replace this problematic belt sander. I've never been able to use the sanding disc because it's um, malformed at the factory. It would shake enough that I could not really do anything fine with it. It was I replaced the sanding disc once and barely used it just because it was so uneven. I did get a lot of use out of this guy here, um, but there's a number of issues with it which I won't go into, although, you know, for the most part it did decent service. It's a uh, Harbor Freight so-called Central Machinery S5154. Um, so while I was at Berlin's House of Tools today, just on a whim, I decided it was time to replace this with something hopefully a little better. I don't know that I'm going to get rid of this one immediately, but uh, maybe I'll move it to the garage or something um, for occasional use out there. I looked at the Grizzly catalog, that's who I usually buy woodworking tools from these days, at least bench mounted things, but they had this Woodstock International Shop Fox. As far as I'm concerned, it's just another name for generic Chinese stuff. But the price was right. Um, it seemed a little nicer um, in the store. Half horsepower, 3600 RPM, 4 inch by 36 inch belt, 6 inch disc, cast iron base, blah 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 release belt lever. It does have a dust port which I thought would come in handy. So I figure I'll belt, you know, bolt it up to the bench and see how it works and not discard the old one as long as it keeps working. Alright, there's the box opened up. All right, what's it say? Model W1855. Same information as on the box. Lots of serious risk warnings. Disc direction, belt direction. There's a little rubber coated uh, bracket there to stop it if you're using it in the horizontal position. And there is sort of a dust catcher down here that uh, apparently goes to this dust collection port. There's the mounting for the table for the disc, which is pre-mounted. It's a fairly coarse sandpaper on here. I'm not sure uh, what grit that is. I'll check it once I get it mounted, I guess. Looks like it mounts with three holes. Kind of nice if they give you the hardware with these things, but of course they never do. You, they don't know what kind of bench you're going to mount it to. Uh, because of the dust collection system on here, the bottom of the disc is covered with this sheet metal bracket that um, goes on like that. The top edge is curled over and it looks like it's supposed to fit really close to the disc. Minimal clearance. So as long as you don't have to change, change the disc often, that's probably a good thing. I'm not crazy about where the power switch is. I'd rather it be on the front, but that's I guess the only place they could put the dust port so it can't go there. I've popped off the electrical panel, just to curious what's inside of there. A not very impressive looking motor which is directly connected, it looks like, to the uh, to the sanding disc. And then um, out the other side is the shaft for the belt going up to the belt sander. Um, I wanted to see 
how the switch uh, the motor is wired with the switch okay incoming power cord is this bottom one and uh, looks like both the hot and neutral sides are switched um, and then let's see so the black goes into there then the black comes out and goes up to what I presume is a what is it, a circuit breaker well it's a coil anyway and then the uh, neutral side coming out of the switch is marked black and that continues on to the motor and then yeah it has the uh, the blue and the white wires coming back here so I think that has to do with starting the motor not really sure on the exact type of motor and its uh, characteristics anyway I was trying to determine if there was any reason why this couldn't be started externally using an external switch and just leave this switch on all the time but uh, the way this is wired up it might possibly not work well that way so the cover snaps back on it also is the top half of the strain relief for the two ground wires and the incoming and outgoing power cords so even though I'd rather use an external switch more conveniently located I'll probably just have to get used to using this one here and when I took off the bottom cover for the disc I did not know that it had slotted holes in it so I think probably if the left hand is slotted in then the right side slots down over the screw you don't actually have to take the screws all the way out just loosen them a bit just remember you're screwing into plastic So this should be the belt loosening lever, and it is, and the belt tracking thumb screw. This is all plastic around here, by the way, covering up cosmetically the sheet metal underneath. So this part here is plastic, this part is plastic, the rest of it is painted cast iron, it looks like. Don't you hate these generic boilerplate blocks of text in manuals um, when whoever put these out didn't even bother conforming them to the machine in, in, that you're particularly dealing with? There's a big hardware recognition chart, and that's fine. They can have a generic one, but there are no bolts like this that are listed, these big ones. All these washers and things almost makes you think those should be included, but it's just generic that's fine um, <clears throat> cleaning the machine unpainted surfaces of your machine are coated with heavy-duty rust preventative uh, no nothing on here that's like that at all everything's painted or it's plastic or yeah this is painted there are no rust preventatives heavy-duty or otherwise on here if you don't count the paint itself this screw here is the one that loosens the belt assembly to go from horizontal to vertical would have been nice if they had done it with a thumb screw but all right at least they included the allen wrench Test fitting the uh, shop vac hose. It does fit in there, but it's totally loose. That's a little bit unfortunate. 
not even enough that you could probably put some tape in there to tighten it up. It's just going to be a little loose. I guess this won't vibrate much. It'll probably stay put if I want to use it. It probably won't shake out too much. With the dust cover off the um, pulley belt, this appears to be metal. That gear is probably metal. This one looks more like plastic, but it might be metal. Um, anyway, it seems okay. This uh, bumper bracket was on crooked. I can see that the holes were not drilled straight in the casting. Um, so I straightened it out anyway. The work table goes on by inserting a pin into a hole. Which gives, I don't know what it is, almost a quarter inch maybe of clearance. And then this knob with this washer goes into a tapped hole down here. it to go down to whatever that angle is. It says here 30 degrees. If the scale is marked for 45, I don't know how you can get it to go much more than... Yeah, you can't get it to go more than 30 degrees before the table bottoms out. Now if you had this mounted on a pedestal instead of a table, then you could get it to go up to the 45. But table mounting, that's sort of a caution. They probably don't point out anywhere that, you know, it's probably advertised somewhere in the specifications as tilting to 45, not if it's on a table. So I'm going to tip it back up so it's at what says, what appears to be zero. And then I'm going to check it for square. Well, it's not hugely off. It needs to be down just a hair. Well, if you look at that, the first grid point is on the yellow. Okay, I've got it trued up. It's pretty close. It's not for precision work, but the scale does, at least on this one, seem to be fairly accurate. Table feels reasonably solid. I think more solid than the the one on here felt. This, even though this is uh, aluminum casting, uh, the the mounting on there is kind of a Dr. Seuss arrangement with a lot of points to add flexibility to the arrangement. Although it does give you adjustability for in and out and up and down, as well as the angle. This only has the one adjustment, and that's for, for angle of tilt. And it does look like it's just a hair under a quarter inch separation, more like three sixteenths at the far end. So it's not square this way. That's not good because that'll throw off the square here. There doesn't seem to be any adjustment for that. Yeah, the the miter um, miter tool um, slot is uh, two and fifteen sixteenths here, and just about two and seven eighths there. So it's off by a sixteenth of an inch, front to rear. You could probably try shimming this, but then I think it would mess up the angle adjustment. Not too practical. So, not a precision deal here. On the other hand, this guy here was two and seven eighths, and two and thirteen sixteenths. It actually, this table on this guy was off by the same exact amount as the table on the new one. The so-called backstop here 
which makes more sense if you're using the um, belt part of the sander in a horizontal configuration. Here I just call it the table or the work rest or something. Goes on with two cap head screws with washers into tapped holes in, um, actually it's more than just tapped. There, um, there's another hole, I'm not sure for what, but fairly, fair, uh, you know, two or three threads anyway through the material. It almost seems like either this is uh, heavier down there or they've got another piece welded on or something. Actually, there's a slight ripple there. They may, in fact, have welded on something thicker to support these screws. Anyway, I didn't have any problem adjusting it for perpendicular to the belt. Unlike that guy down there, which just had one screw, and uh, I could never get it to remain square. You know, it wasn't horrible, but it was unadjustable in a way that it would hold and be relied upon. So I think the two screws here is good. Seems pretty solid, and it's supposed to be adjusted about an eighth of an inch out, and because of the slotting here, you can adjust it in and out to suit. So far so good. Now I'm wondering about, not that it really matters that much, but um, how vertical is this guy? With it tipped up as far as it would go, it seems to be pretty much square, so that's good. Not that it would change the work at all. So I need to use the included wrench to tighten this down some more, now that it's in a good position. You can really tell that this piece of equipment was designed to go with this side facing the operator and this tilted down. It's optimized for that kind of configuration. If you're trying to use it vertically, you probably wouldn't want this with the operator being this way. You'd want it tipped. But the dust extraction port, everything really points, and the switch location points at them figuring the operator would be over here. So that's not too great from my perspective. Um, I gotta think about this a little bit yet. I think I can probably just bend the cord around to the back. I'm not crazy about that. Okay, let's see what happens when I throw the switch. This seems fairly flat. I don't see any wobble on it. The belt tracking is pretty good. I can move it around. So let's see if I can answer the question I had earlier. If I turn the switch here on and just power it up by plugging it in, will the motor start properly? Seemed to start just fine and in the right direction. I could swear I hear a click from down in here a split second after I plug it in. But that may actually be coming from the motor itself. It might be a starting coil or something on the motor. Um, not really sure what the coil down here does, but um, maybe somebody who knows more about the types of motors used in these can weigh in on comments or something. I'm not really sure what class of motor it is. Um, anyway, seems to work okay. 
Now, as far as removing the belt, let's see. Okay, as far as getting the belt off, they say to tip this back a few degrees. About like that, thereabouts. And move the lever full up. Oh, I know, it, it probably works just fine if it's tipped all the way up unless it catches on this finger of plastic here. That might be why you want to tip it back. Okay, this is a P80 belt, so it's fairly coarse. The uh, old sander had a P120, so 120 grit. It comes with a very coarse belt, in other words. Now this is the belt from my old machine. And it's the same size, good deal. So I'm probably going to have to look into my inventory. I have this old one that's still serviceable. And I have another P120 that's brand new. 3M, only the finest. So I have at least another 120. If I want to put this monster 80 grit on here. Looks like it's easiest if you put it on the top first to get it over the lip of the the guard. Let's test this out with the dust collector aka my shop vac. I just noticed that there's a divider in here so the dust coming from here comes to the divider and anything you plug in here it can't backtrack or settle into the lower port which comes from this other one so it's actually one port here being divided into here and to there. It's kind of interesting. So grab myself a piece of wood There's some residual dust around here, but not as much as I might have expected without the dust collector. And there's very little down here, a little bit stuck around the label, but really nothing down here. And there wasn't anything on top of the hose really either. So I'd say the dust collection on here is fairly effective. 
As for the miter tool, this appears to be a piece of metal here instead of a piece of metal looking plastic, but the whole miter tool itself, including the bar, is plastic. Solid ABS plastic, by golly, nothing but the finest. Well, the pointer's metal. Yeah, well, you didn't expect wonderful things on a tool like this, really. Oops, especially when you drop it on the floor. Well, it could only make it better, I think. <clears throat> it's surprisingly <laughs> heavy on this end. I didn't expect it to tip that way, because usually these bars are very heavy. So, eh, I don't think I'll be using it that much. <clears throat> Put it under there, forget about it, hopefully. Um, yeah, so I think think it's a relative winner. I'm not disappointed with it anyway so far. Um, it looks nicer. <laughs> the adjustments are so more solid and easier to use. The dust port's a nice thing. Um, the adjustment here is better and this feels more solid. So yeah, I think it's a good thing. I have to do some head scratching to determine if there's any reason why I can't remote switch this, because I really would like to have a switch more up front somewhere. It might be worth just contacting ShopFox, or whoever this product is again. Already forgot. Yeah, ShopFox. Uh, tech support to see if they have any admonitions for or against um, remote switching this guy, but from my empirical testing it seems to be okay. So there's that tool. One small refinement. I usually kind of hate it when um, equipment I've got that comes with specific tools like this doesn't have a um, a place to put them to keep them with the tool. I kind of wish they had a, you know, little box attached or a couple of clips or something. Um, many of my tools, I just put a neodymium magnet against them and then clip the tool against the magnet. On this one, I just took a little aluminum angle bracket, drilled and tapped a hole up in an area where, when I had the electrical box removed, I recognized there was nothing right in that spot especially up high like this, so I just have a little place to put that tool there so it's where I'll see it when I'm working in the area that needs it most. Keep it with the tool. Since uh, real estate is always precious on my workbenches, um, I keep my cardboard box with spare sanding belts down there and a couple of end mill sets or steel and aluminum, my box of popsicle sticks, um, 1,000 pieces, <laughs> which I've mentioned in other videos. One of the best purchases I made on Amazon as far as value and utility. And behind it, my clamping uh, part assortment for my milling machine. Well, sometimes it helps to accumulate stuff, and if you can remember the junk you've got, sometimes you can save money. So besides uh, making recent projects out of mostly scrap materials that I have in my shop, trying to figure out this uh, Shop Fox belt sander um, and trying to get a switch that is in a better position, I had a brainstorm and I remembered that I had this tucked away behind a couple of spare sump pumps. And it's just a uh, float switch, but the most important thing is it has one of these switched pass-through type um, plugs on it and a 8-foot cord. More than enough. And I've got a whole bunch of old Radio Shack project boxes and in my electrical box I have a toggle switch SPST that's rated for three-quarter uh, horsepower motors 
120 volts. It's a half horsepower motor on that belt sander. And uh, I don't know what the ratings are on this thing. Um, I don't know where it says, but it's for sump pumps, and they're usually bigger. So I think that'll probably be adequate. So here's that guy, and it's rated for, well, it just says full load amps, 13 full load amps at 120 volts, um, 78 resistive amps at the same voltage. So I know this thing doesn't take 13 amps. Um, and here's the pass through plug outlet so this plugs into a wall socket and then the load normally a sump pump but in this case the bench uh, sander belt sander will plug in here and then one of those leads probably the hot lead is run through this cable into the float switch and back so all I need to do is cut off the float switch and terminate it to this guy put it in this box and mount that to the workbench in a more desirable location. Okay, I've cut the float off. I've taken my plastic box and put two holes in the bottom for I think they're number six sheet metal screws. Just what I had on hand. Boy, this is staticky. Uh, I've drilled a hole in the back that's just barely big enough for the jacket of the cord to go through. I'm going to use one of these tie wraps that came with the float switch as a strain relief. And then I've drilled a hole on the other side that hopefully will be adequate to put this switch into. Alright, I've stripped back a few inches of the cable jacket. All right, I've got one of those zip ties tied around the jacket so it won't pull back through. Just cut off the excess here. There we go. Now the switch is going to take up most of the room in here. About like this. But I've got it figured out so the the conductors will curl around and come into the back of the switch. These are not really too good for stranded wire and that's what this is so I need to put crimp lugs on these and I believe I have some in my parts bin. Alright a couple of fork lugs are on there and uh, I'll screw those onto the switch terminals now. All right, that's in there with on to the right. Do I have it? Good thing that box isn't any smaller. I can actually have the uh, lugs come off the sides, but they'll fit in this way. It's fine. Just clean the plastic top of the case with isopropyl alcohol. And uh, while I was upstairs, getting the fork lugs, I used my brother um, TZ label printer to make a label for this thing. It'll be easier to read than what's on the switch plate. So as soon as the alcohol is completely evaporated, I'll put that on. Okay, there we go. Alright, I've got the box screwed down to the bench just in front of where the table will be for the disc sander but not in the way of anything else and it won't prevent the table from tilting down as far as it can before it hits the bench. So I just need to roll these wires back up so they fit in there. Pop this guy on there.
put in the four screws, tighten her down. Okay, so the cord runs along the side of the sander. It's coiled up here a little bit, and then it plugs into one of the outlets on the wall. Plug this guy back. That's my air compressor. Always oh, scares the crap out of me when it goes off. Okay, so what was I doing? Oh, yeah. So now I've got the uh, belt sander and it's going to be plugged in to the back of that guy. And now if I turn this on, the belt sander will not run. Did I mention that I'd sent a contact us communication through the ShopFox website for their tech support and got a response within 24 hours saying they actually weren't sure so they checked it out and found out that yes it is safe to run this using an external power switch and leaving this switch on all the time that it won't burn the motor out or do anything unto forward. So let's see. success. That's a pretty clean solution, I think. Better than I would have hoped for originally. And there it is, an optimal location. And I have enough cord on here where if I ever relocate the bench relative to the socket, I've got several feet of additional cord. Um, so it's not what I originally thought was just have enough cord to run from the switch up to that um, that pass-through plug, but I think this is better. It'll get covered with uh, cobwebs and sawdust soon enough. And it's hiding out here nicely under the table, and I won't bump into it in front. Good solution, I think. Those viewers who saw my recent video on building this vertical uh, storage rack for um, plywood, masonite, and so on may recall how when I was trying to cut these out I used my jigsaw or um, I keep using the wrong word my saber saw um, and uh, it was cutting at an angle instead of perpendicular to the wood because it was a longer blade and uh, it just wasn't stiff enough so it would bend a little bit. And to get it evened out more, I realized I didn't have any tool that would level it out that would fit into those spaces, especially the ones that were in the middle of the boards. I just couldn't get it on any sander or tool that I had um, to really do it properly. If I move the bandsaw way out in the middle of the room, I might have been able to do it on there. Even then, it, the, these boards are long and unwieldy. I wasn't sure I could do it there. So I ended up just sanding it with my Dremel tool sanding drum, which was very laborious and imprecise. And so, while I was at Berlin's House of Tools today, um, in addition to buying that ShopFox bench belt sander, I picked up this Makita model 9031 handheld belt sander sometimes called a um, a hand or what do they call them there's another name something to do with filing but um, handheld strip sander handheld belt sander rotary file whatever the names are they give these things and I had selected uh, from an online search I thought I might buy this Astro Tools one with a half inch belt and 18 inch long belt which is air powered but fairly economical or possibly for about the same money 
a uh, tool from Grizzly, <clears throat> which is a half inch by 18, so the same belt. Um, but I kind of wanted something a tad wider, and I saw this one here that was 3 8 of an inch, and uh, it's not, that was too narrow for my needs. But I knew that they had one that was almost identical that used a wider belt. Um, so one and three sixteenths inch, or one and an eighth, I guess, thereabouts, close to it. They're all standard sizes, and I'm pretty sure if you buy a sanding belt for a Makita tool, you'll probably be able to buy them, since it's a popular enough brand. Anyway, these had very good reviews, even though the price is a lot more. Um, I usually buy myself a Christmas present every year, and I didn't do it in 2021, so I rationalized by saying, well, this is my Christmas present to myself for Christmas 2021. And that's how you get toys, by rationalizing things to yourself. Um, so, it was a bit of a pricey day, I think along with the Shop Fox sander and a spare belt for that tool, another 80 grit one. Um, and this I was into it for maybe $500. So let's unbox this guy. Unlike some other sanders they had, this one comes with um, quite a few belts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Looks like it comes with ten belts. I don't know if they're all the same grit or not. There's a side handle. Okay, there it is. <clears throat> Looks like a fairly long cord, but I haven't measured it yet. Model 9031. Here it calls it an inch and an eighth. So, depends which way you round it. This belt is measuring out to an inch and an eighth. But uh, I don't know why it says on the box inch and three sixteenths. Because it almost looks like if it was that extra sixteenth it would be too wide. But maybe there is a belt that size and uh, it would probably still fit this. Or maybe that's just a crappy uh, conversion from the metric that it's a 30 millimeter belt. And it's really close to that too, but it's it's not exactly 30 millimeters, it's a little bit under. So it looks like the more exact measurement is one and an eighth, so that's what I'm gonna call it. So uh, 120 volts, 5 amps, 60 hertz. Blah, 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 moves at 3280 feet per minute. Lots of uh, different languages here. Well, only two on the label. It's a brushed motor, not a uh, DC motor with a rectifier. There is a dust port on the back. with a spring-loaded cover. But uh, nothing going to it. I don't know if that's a standard size or not, but there's no hose or other fittings included with the product. Um, looks like a fairly substantial tensioning mechanism, and there's this uh, spring plate that runs the whole bottom here. That's something else I liked about this. Some of the other ones I found, the only place they had a support plate was out near the end. Uh, and then the rest of this would be unsupported. Maybe that can actually come in handy to sand around curved objects. I'm not sure. But then, really, you could use this side to sand around curved objects, the side that's not supported by a plate. So either way, I think it would work. I'm 
not sure offhand. I think this is just to adjust the tension here. Have to read the instructions. So there's with the side handle on it. This will flop around. So if you're using it this way, for example, you can have the handle on one side and sand with either side of the tool. I guess theoretically you could put the handle on the other side, but uh, then it be uh, there'd be risk of it just running into the belt or taking your knuckles off if it slips, because this is freely moving here. And I suppose you can, I don't know if you can just remove it all together without messing up the way things fit. The tool does have a trigger lock. And down here on the bottom is an adjustment for speed. Not all of these have speed adjustments. This goes from 1 to 10, but I'm disappointed to find out that they didn't make it go up to, um, does it go up to 6? It only goes up to 6. It could have gone up to 11. They could have had some fun with it. Speed adjusting dial, 1 to 6. You can go infinite adjustment between 3.3 meters or 656 feet per minute and 16.6 me uh, meters or 3280 feet per minute. Oh wait. Ah, I like that. The belt speed can be infinitely adjusted between 3.3 meters. Okay. What are they saying? 3.3 meters or 656 feet slash minutes and 16.6 meters or 332.80 feet per minute per second. Ah! That's kind of boogered up. I think they could have uh, not screwed that up so royally. So here's the conundrum. Not that it makes a big difference to me, but on the model 9031, it says on the instructions 3.3 to 16.6, and then they boggled the meter. They boggled the meters and seconds and minutes all up in the way they phrased it. It's just a total cluster, but it should be meters per second, and then seven or 656 to 3280 feet per minute. I'm sure is what they meant. Um, and just to make sure they converted it properly, uh, 3.8 meters over one second, that's 3.3 meters per second, times 3.28 feet over one meter, times 30, 60 seconds over one minute. All of these are ones, so you end up with a one on the bottom. 3.3 times 3.28 times 60 gives you 649.4 feet per minute. So that's what it actually would be, assuming that it's 3.3 meters per second. So it's in the ballpark of 656, but it's far enough off that they didn't do the math. Let's check the other end. 16.6 meters per second from here. Same conversions, 300 or 3266.9 feet per minute, which again is a ways away from 3280 feet per minute. This is not a rounding error, this is just a screw up, like somebody used a slide rule to do it or something. It's amazing in this day and age, right? So what's true? Is it really 3.3 to 16.6 meters per second? Or is it really 649.4 feet per minute to 3266.9 feet per minute? I don't know. And I'm not going to bother finding out. It just illustrates how even a leading company like Makita can just screw something like that up royally. Shame on you, Makita. What did you say? Perhaps they just had a misprint in the manual. 
Uh, here's the website. They don't mention um, meters per second at all on here. It just says 656 to 3280 feet per minute, which is what it said in the manual. Just that the metric doesn't match. Okay. So I was thinking I might want to buy one of these uh, uh, dust removal hoses. And it does say in the manual that you should use one if you've got a dust collector or a vacuum cleaner. But it mentions the model numbers of the dust collectors, but it doesn't mention anywhere I've been able to find what the model number of the hose is, even though they make it sound like it's an available accessory. So I'll have to go look on their website. Again, you just wonder who puts these manuals together. You know, is it a bad translation from Japanese? Or are they just morons? <laughs> or careless? Or what have you? It's always disappointing when you get a manual. You can see that it was written with minimal effort and either inaccurate or not thorough or leaves out obvious questions that users of the product might ask. I've written technical manuals for products my entire career and I would have been fired a long time ago if I turned out manuals like the ones that come with most products I buy. Alright. Okay, as for uh, getting the belt on and off, you're supposed to fold the handle up and then just push down. Oops, not quite like that like that to get the belt off. And while we're doing that, let's take a look at the belt kit included with the product. The belt that's on there appears to be um, I guess it's a 100 grit. So they're definitely not all the same. There is a 40 grit, another 40 grit, a 60 grit, um, another 60 grit, an 80 grit, and two of them, a 100 grit to complement the one that came on the tool, but there's also, where does it say, another, so you actually get three 100 grits, one on the tool and two in the uh, accessories, and then a 120 grit and another one of those, so two 120s, two 100s plus the one on the tool, two 80s, two 60s, and two 40s. That's a pretty good range, I think. And then to get it back on, you slip it over there, push down, and slip it back on. But you probably want to make sure that it's got the right direction of travel. The arrow on the inside of the belt and that marked on the rear pulley must point in the same direction. So there is a uh, arrow there pointing in this direction. So we want the arrow on the bottom or the arrow on the top to be pointing correctly. Well, this belt doesn't seem to have any arrows. Oh, no they are. They were just covered up with the Makita logo. So, okay.
Now I'd taken a bit of a break from doing this box opening review and I went upstairs and fired off a contact us to Makita just pointing out the error in their some of their specifications and I also wondered if I actually used a 1 and 3 16th inch belt instead of the 1 and an eighth that all these are if that would present any problems wearing out part of the tool or something it looks like it probably would be okay but um, and the pulley here which has sides on it definitely looks like it can accommodate up to one and a quarter actually before it rubs on it but um, some of that's just me trying to be helpful part of its me being a smart ass um, part of me is just telling them they should have tried harder there is nothing on here about how to adjust this guy so maybe you can't yeah they just don't uh, mention anything here about adjusting it for for tracking so perhaps it's not really an issue all right I've got it plugged in let's just see what it does when I push the trigger actually I'm going to do it upside down so I can watch the belt tracking a little better Well, it's up against one side here, and it's off a little bit to the side there. I mean, it doesn't seem like this adjustment here would do anything, and it seems kind of odd. Do they mention that at all? Or, well, no, they just talk about using the, uh, yeah. They talk about replacing the carbon brushes. They mention op optional accessories, which just... Oh, they do. Tiny print down here on the bottom. Hose number 28. I guess that's the entire part number. Alright. It says optional... <laughs> An optional hose 28 millimeter... In inner diameter is necessary. Well, if you have a hose with an inner diameter of 28 millimeters, it won't fit over this because it's almost exactly 30 millimeters and if you want it to go on the inside then you don't care about the ID and the OD of a hose that would fit in here is just a hair under 25 millimeters so I don't know what that nonsense in the book is an optional hose 28 millimeters in uh, in inner diameter. God, that's messed up. And on this diagram, they do say item two is hose 19, as if it's a part number. There's no units. But then on the other side, they say hose 28 like it's a part number and here they make it sound like the hose is 28 millimeters in inner diameter good well then this says when connecting to a Makita vacuum cleaner an optional hose 28 millimeters in diameter inner diameter is necessary when connecting to a Makita dust collector such as model 420S the hose of the dust collector is not necessary the hose of the dust collector is not necessary. You can connect the belt sander directly to the optional hose 28, which is not the same as the hose 19. What? Ah, somebody should be shot at dawn. I'm telling you, there's no excuse for that nonsense. Now, um, since I've been running this tool, I got some debris. 
Um, I think this has got to be tension. That's all I can see that being. I don't really want to have my hands on that. Um, Alright, when I turned this wheel in the clockwise direction when viewed from the operator's side of the tool, it did move the belt a little bit to the left and brought it a little more centered back here. doesn't seem like I could budget any more than that. At least it's not rubbing on the side flange over here. So I'm not sure if that's supposed to really be tension or if it's supposed to somehow be used for tracking. Maybe when I just changed the tension it tracked a little different just because of that. But again I'm going to have to fire off another message to Makita because I really want to know if that's supposed to be a tracking adjustment or what? Shame on them for not describing it in the manual. All right, let's see this guy in operation. That seemed to work pretty well. That's a very aggressive grid on there, so it really cut into this pine really quickly, but it seemed to work well. The belt stayed on track while I was doing it. Uh, now let's um, Let's use it on the other side. I'm just actually going to hold the tool upside down here just so I can use that more conveniently. I'll push the trigger with my thumb and now the handles on top instead of on the bottom like it was before. Well, that worked out pretty well, too. It wasn't that hard to hold upside down. Um, so, obviously I could have used it handle under and held it up against something, but it does seem like it'll work, you know, if you um, do it like that and go down on something, <coughs> as long as you don't mind pushing the trigger with your thumb instead of your forefinger. This makes enough dust that if I'm using a normal handheld belt sander, a big one, it's usually pretty far from where I'm working, but with this thing being handheld in a more immediate way, the dust that it's kicking out is practically right in my face. <coughs> like that. So I think I may actually want to invest in some sort of a hose that will adapt to my shop vac. Uh, or failing that, if not to the big shop vac, I may be able to find something that goes into my DeWalt handheld shop vac, or I could um, 
maybe find something at the hardware store that'll adapt up to fit into here and then go into the back. So we'll see on that. But I'll fire off an email or a contact us message to Makita asking them for the specifics on the hose since the manual's pretty messed up. Anyway, I think that concludes my review of this product. Seems like a pretty good quality product. Seems reasonably well thought out. Again, too bad the manual isn't. Well, I finally got a hold of uh, another person at Makita Tech Support. He said that um, there is no belt tracking adjustment on this tool. That it just should run true by its design. It's okay to have it up against the flanges of the drive pulley as long as it's not to the point of tearing up the pulley or the belt. If it does that, then you can play with the tension and maybe improve it, but it's not really supposed to require um, adjustment in that regard. This is supposed to be a belt tension control, not a belt tracking control, but as I just said, I was advised that it can have an influence on tracking if the tracking is off, you can play with the tension, see if it helps. It does seem to be a fairly robust mechanism here, um, more than some other ones I looked at. Um, and uh, this adjustment here can be useful. If you put on different belts, it might be slightly different lengths and so on. You can kind of make up the difference by adjusting it. Uh, and also, depending on, you know, what kind of work you're doing and some other factors uh, you might want the belt a little looser or a little tighter he said basically if it's not so slack that it's slipping or coming off or not so tight that it's acting bindy or having other problems then um, you can have the tension in different areas there is a stop down here you can't adjust it any further than that uh, so that's Makita's official statement regarding this adjustment and belt tracking, which was a question I had earlier. All right trying to settle things with the dust extraction hose before I end this video. Um, I gave uh, Makita 24 hours to respond to my technical inquiry about dust extraction hose accessories and they didn't respond but I was able to call them just before they closed this afternoon and a helpful fellow there said he was also stymied by the manual once he started reading it and um, he basically came to the same conclusion that I had that the um, dust collection port or dust extraction port on the sander has an OD of um, 30 millimeters but you're not supposed to slip something over it the hose is supposed to go inside of it and that's 25 millimeters or one inch so you need a hose with an OD of one inch or 25 millimeters. Um, according to the information he had, this is on the Makita website, this model 192108A is the one that their resource database says is the hose for this tool. It's a, a 10 foot hose listed as one inch I love it when they do that, one inch at which end, you know, right? Um, so, all the information they have is here. It's a one inch OD. Again, they don't say at which end, but he confirmed that it's at the small end. And um, for use with random orbital sanders as well as other tools and adapters. 
fits most wet dry vacuums. Well, um, it doesn't say here, but there is a picture there with some dimensions. If you do that, it shows that, yes, it's a one inch OD on the small end, and then the big end is one and a half inch OD and one and a quarter inch ID. So, probably some sort of an adapter will be needed. I forgot one of my shop vacs. This is the one I take with me to the museum where I volunteer sometimes. And, um, its fittings are in fact one and a half inch ID. So when the Makita website says that uh, it'll fit most wet dry vacuums, they're not referring to the bigger ones, but they are referring to the the smaller sizes. So I go to Amazon, which supposedly sells everything and they do have a Makita 192-108A it doesn't match the picture on the website exactly but uh, on the Makita website that is and as usual they've got the specifications all boogered up here um, you know, I don't know how anybody's supposed to make sense of it when they just randomly pick parts of the specification three-quarter inch ID diameter, okay. The D means diameter, you don't need to say diameter. One inch OD diameter. Which end are you talking about? You know, it's like, good grief. I'm sure that the small end is going to fit because both Makita and their website show that pretty clearly. And I know from their website that the big end of this is supposed to be one and a half inch OD. There's no price on this thing. You can't actually buy it. It's listed. It's not uh, not available. So that's no good. I can't buy it through them. If I go back to Makita, try to buy it from them. Buy now. It just tells you where you might be able to go in the Los Angeles area to buy it. That's not too useful. Home Depot lists it, but says it's not available or delivery unavailable, not sold in stores. In other words, you can't get it. You can't order it. You can't go into a store and get it. Why is it on your website, Home Depot? Well, it looks like Granger has it. Yeah, 3867 web price but everything seems to suggest that they have it so what if I just drag a box around it and now I've got both things selected and the alignment tool is there and I want to align by centers so I've placed it on the bed now it changed to orange I'm going to export the g-code so I just um, saved it on my SD card that I use for the Prusa 3D printer plug the card into here and I find immediately the adapter select that, checking the file it's heating the bed I've already alcohol wiped the print surface this is actually the very first thing that I've that I'm going to be printing on this printer that I've designed myself and it's a very minimal design obviously um, almost no effort went into it we'll see if it turns out the way I expect it to it's also the first time I've used Tinkercad so hopefully it's reasonably idiot proof
it's estimating a print time of four hours. I'm sure I have the print settings much finer than they need to be, but since I'm not experienced in doing this design, That should have been the skirt there. So we can see the inner and outer dimensions there. So it's trying to build the solid surface at the end of the part. So now it's starting to build up the inner and outer surfaces and then it'll do some infill in between. see the raised inner and outer edges there. Yeah, now it's moving faster because it's doing just an infill. It's doing the actual infill now instead of the solid end plate of the object. Well, progress is being made. We're down to the last couple minutes. Looks like it's skinning over the top of the piece, so it's got to be nearly done. Should be about done. There we go. Four hours and six minutes. Well, let's see if it came out the way it was expected to. Looks like it's right on the money. The camera's getting some parallax here, but it's right on two inches oh, um, OD and inch and a half ID. And two and a half inches long. It's exactly the size I expected it to be. Okay, Granger came up with the official Makita dust collection hose, part number 192108A. And uh, I have my 3D printed, almost color matched adapter. There's the small end, and there is the glorious 10 foot length. Should be long enough for most things, I think. You know, get a good distance from the nearest dust collector port or shot vac and the tool. I notice that this isn't round, but it's kind of a squashy material. It probably is one inch in diameter, OD that is, at the small end, although it's a little bit off now to the, the slight ovalization of this thing. So if I pop the cover open, this will plug in there. have to squeeze it a little bit to make it less oval. And it fits in there pretty tightly and verifying that the OD of the large end is about an inch and a half. Again, it's slightly ovaloid here, but and unlike the hose itself, which is kind of springy, I would have preferred it to be a little more flaccid, if you will. Um, the, the actual end pieces are much squishier and compliant uh, to fit into various things. So let's see if it'll 
fit into my adapter or if it needs messing around with tape or something to get it to fit. Well, it does go into my adapter. It's a tight fit. That's good. Certainly not going to fall out. And the other end, here's the hose of my shop vac. And that fits in there a little more loosely. Certainly, um, it could have stood to be just a hair bigger. I just put a little bit of painter's masking tape on there. So that's two wraps all the way around. I can always take some off. Yeah, that fits pretty well. One reason I made this uh, adapter two and a half inches long, I figured about up to one inch of this fitting into here and one inch of this fitting into here, leaving about a half inch gap between them. And if it, if I feel like the shop vac is laboring, like it can't get enough through this hose, and keep in mind that the motors on the shop vacs, which deliver all the, you know, motive force, take a lot of current, at least on the bigger shop vacs. You know, they're fairly powerful motors. They generate some heat, and usually the air exiting after the filter in the vacuum exits through the motor to keep it cool. And if you don't um, have enough airflow, then the motor can overheat potentially, which is why a lot of things that throttle down larger vacuums to smaller vacuums have a bleed hole in their adapters so you can let a little air in there to make up for what can't be practically drawn through the smaller hose. So I figured if I feel like it's straining I can drill a small hole in here and just adjust it to larger sizes until I feel like I've got the right balance of airflow and still adequate suction. All right, let's test this guy out. I'll turn on the shop vac first. You can hear the hissing over here. Or actually, from around here. The uh, hose unscrewed from the uh, threaded insert here. Okay, so I took off a fair amount of wood with it here, and uh, if I pull this out, it's pretty clean back in there, so I think that worked pretty well. There's no noticeable dust on the floor. Um, I don't know if it's a safety thing or what, but this hose doesn't thread all that solidly into the fittings. Um, I think if you had something tripped over the hose or something, it might pop the hose out of the fitting before it would yank the tool off of a table or out of somebody's hands, for example. So that might be deliberate. In any case, it's a good idea to probably make sure these are threaded on because I think this was just barely engaged thread-wise from the factory. Now down at this end, uh, as soon as I started the tool, my vacuum pulled the adapter down inside the hose. 
but that didn't hurt anything. It only just went in a little bit. And clearly some dust was coming down this pipe here and is held by static to the inside of the adapter. So yeah, I think this worked out pretty well. I've cut a one inch wide piece of brass, six inches long, <clears throat> and I'm using my rollers to try to form it into uh, pretty close to the right size already. All right, unlock the top roller, pull it out, slide the workpiece off, and it's uh, just about exactly the size I want, just slightly undersized, which would be good to have some spring tension on it. Okay, I've sprung it over, fits down and covers those holes, and has a nice fit all the way around. So now I can use it without vacuum relief. But um, it's a little bit long. I need to cut off a little bit of it because um, I overestimated how much length I needed on it. There we go. So I can slide this guy around to cover up some or all of the bleed holes. That was easy to do and I think it'll work pretty well. Keep in mind this is the part that goes into the shop vac hose and this is the side that the Makita dust extraction hose goes inside so there's no conflict outside in this part. I think that's my final word on this. Hope you found this to be interesting.